Hey everyone, welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I am your host, Ari Witten, and today I have with me a friend of mine who I met uh, just a few weeks ago and, and had some great conversations with. Uh, he's an MD and his name is Dr. Scott Schur. He is a board certified internal medicine physician specializing in health optimization medicine and hyperbaric oxygen therapy. We actually met at the inaugural health optimization uh, event conference. Yes, we did. And uh, he is the founding organizer of Health Optimization Medicine in the USA, which is a new paradigm of wellness medicine drawn from the current specialties of anti aging medicine, nutritional medicine, longevity medicine, regenerative medicine, age, man <laughs> age management medicine, sports medicine, and rejuvenative medicine. That is it's a cool. lot of medicine. It, it's just cool. It's, it's, it's good. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, so home will bridge conventional and alternative medicine through both physician and practitioner training, as well as by providing a turnkey practice platform. So welcome, Dr. Sure Scott. Can I call you Scott? Please. All right. Yes. <laughs> okay, cool. And you can just say that I'm, a, I'm an internal medicine doc. I'm a hyperbaric oxygen therapy doc, and I'm a health optimization medicine doctor. That's it. Just to, okay. There's just a lot less medicines in that bio. Yeah, I just try to. I, I could have made it more simple. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to have you. And, uh, you know, on a personal note, it was great to connect with you in person and, and fun to have conversations with you in person. And, um, it was awesome to meet. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, I, I learned uh, about your story really too, Ari. forward to this. Yeah. So this podcast is going to be all about hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Right. Um, now, just to get us started with a very broad question, since not everybody's going to have heard of that and have mm -hmm. any idea of what it is. Can you mm -hmm. talk about what hyperbaric oxygen therapy actually is? Yes, that's a good place to start. I can't tell you how many people ask me about the word hyperbaric. They think of hyperbolic or bariatric <laughs> or cryotherapy is a common one that I get. Mm -hmm. All very reasonable. I mean, we're using these chambers and they're these sealed tubes, sometimes translucent, sometimes with little port submarine looking things. And hyperbaric, the word means increased atmospheric pressure. So what we're doing in a chamber is we're simulating the pressure that you would feel if you were underneath water. And so water is heavy, as we all know, if you pick it up and carry it. But if you're actually diving underneath the sea or even in a pool, uh, you don't feel that water pressure because you're weightless in actually the water. That's why it's good to do exercise in it if you have arthritis, for example. And so what we're doing is we're simulating that pressure in this chamber and we're actually combining that pressure with an increased amount of inspired oxygen. So the amount of oxygen that you're breathing. So that typically you and I are, you know, you're in San Diego, I'm in San Francisco, we're breathing 21% oxygen at sea level. The rest of the air that we're breathing is like 80% nitrogen, just about a couple other gases as well, but for the most part, nitrogen. And so what we do is we, get rid of all those other gases, and we just breathe 100% oxygen under the pressure. And when you do that, you basically drive a lot more oxygen into circulation. And it's all by physics, and it's a physics law. The more oxygen you put under pressure, or the more gas you put under the pressure, the more that pressure is going to exert an effect on the blood vessels to allow that gas to go into liquid form. And so we're not talking about actually diffusing any more oxygen onto the red blood cell. The red blood cell is the oxygen carrying cell usually. Most of us that have normal lungs can carry enough oxygen with the red blood cells already. And, and if, if you've had like a pulse ox before, like a pulse oximeter on your finger, for the most part, if you have normal lungs, we're talking like you know, 98, 99% oxygen saturation. So there's not a whole lot more you can do by just giving enough, more oxygen, unless you have a pneumonia, or if you have COPD, emphysema, et cetera. Now, where we can exert an effect, though, is on the plasma of the blood, which is the liquid of your blood. In the liquid, there's not a whole lot of oxygen actually that's saturated at sea level. But in a chamber, combining hyperbaric oxygen pressure, so the pressure plus the oxygen, you can drive up to about 1,200% more oxygen or even more therapeutically. And in fact, they've done studies on animals, not humans, but there's a reflection in humans that if you're at three atmospheres absolute of pressure, which is equivalent to 66 feet of seawater underneath the water, you can saturate enough oxygen into plasma that you don't actually need, you don't need red blood cells to carry oxygen. Wow. And so this is used therapeutically for people that have severe traumatic anemias. So you got into a car accident, you're bleeding out, you can go into a chamber to temporize, 
if you are a Jehovah's Witness, for example, also you don't want blood transfusions. This is a temporizing maneuver. And so it's actually in trauma centers, and that's where I first came into contact with hyperbaric therapy, it was in the traumatic setting, looking at the traumatic limb am amputations, carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, flesh-eating bacteria, some crazy stuff. But I, I realized that it was so simple, like I discussed, just oxygen and pressure. And my mind went kind of like, well, why aren't we using this for more? And then I kind of went into the research. I delved in. This is back in like 2007, I think I started. And over the last, I guess, 10 years now, I've just learned more about it and learned just the understanding of how universal the, the technology was to healing. And so that's why I got excited. Yeah. So uh, it's funny. My mind's buzzing with so many different questions and avenues. That's why we I stopped. <laughs> One one thing, I guess, before we get into some of my more specific questions, is mm -hmm. I'm just curious, what's the history of hyperbaric? How did this actually start? How did I guess? How did it? Mm -hmm. How was it discovered? Uh, and then, sure. like that, this has beneficial effects on human health, and and then how did it kind of that translate into people starting to use it? Yeah, it's got a crazy charlatan story behind it, actually. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> like a lot of great medicine, right? It yeah. starts. Uh, and there's still some people who think that hyperbaric oxygen therapy is a treatment without a disease, you know, quote unquote. Mm. It started back in the 1600s, actually, before they knew what oxygen was. They just knew that if you attached an organ bellow, so like those old, or old organ bellows that kind of blow air in mm. and out, if they sucked air out of a sealed chamber or if they pressurized air into a chamber, they realized that people were feeling differently, surprisingly, of course, not that surprisingly now depending on if they did one or the other. And so there was sanitariums back in the 1800s and even operating rooms, even in the early 1900s and a little bit before that, where they were doing these kinds of things and looking to see how they would affect physiology. So they take air out of chambers and they thought that would help with tuberculosis, for example. Or if they, they put air into chambers and they thought that would help with more acute conditions. But it wasn't really until diving and learning that if they had people that were sunk underneath the water building bridges, the Brooklyn Bridge being the most famous example, that if these guys came up too fast, they get these terrible symptoms that they called the bends. Mm -hmm. And some people would die, have seizures, paralysis. But if they went back into these chambers underneath the, the water, all their symptoms would go away if they didn't end up dead first, of course. <laughs> if you're dead, you're dead, right? Mm -hmm. um, but um, anyway, so what they realized if they could simulate this same environment in a chamber, in, in a pressurized vessel, um, they would have the same effect. So that's how hyperbaric therapy got its start. And that's why our terminology uh, is all in diving parlance, right? So we call a hyperbaric treatment a dive, for example. And we call, um, and we, everything is equivalent in seawater, right? So that's why I was mentioning 66 feet of seawater for the equivalent of a pressure. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't until the 1950s or so that it started being used more formally in operating rooms, before there was a cardiac bypass machine, there was hyperbaric oxygen therapy pressurized operating rooms, kind of like what I was mentioning before, but more formalized. And in fact, even now, there is some pretty good data that if you put somebody in a chamber with 100% oxygen, before they get on a bypass machine for a cardiac surgery, they have less neurocognitive issues afterwards, which is a big problem, actually, for patients that go on bypass machines for long periods of time. So in any respect, the, the history becomes more medical in the 1950s or so, and then transitions with carbon monoxide poisoning. Because again, carbon monoxide is a severe illness, right? You have CO, carbon monoxide molecule attached to red blood cells, and you can't get oxygen to your blood. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy under pressure, you drive a lot more oxygen into circulation. You outcompete out -compete the carbon monoxide molecule. Basically, I saw people that were intubated on respirators walk out of the chamber after treatment because of this effect. So, and then really over the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen it for optimal performance types of things, also for complex medical illness. And we can talk about all these, but, um, but also insurance approved still for things like diabetic foot ulcers. So preventing amputations, which is really, really effective. Uh, radiation injury from cancer, which is a radiation injury that happens after getting cancer treatment with radiation, and then you're left with a, you know, maybe you're left without cancer, but you're left with a debilitating 
a morbidity or, or disability as a result of it. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not debilitating, if it's moderate, we can still help in the chamber. And then there's a couple others that are more in the acute setting. And then there's this large box that we'll likely talk about mostly, which is complex medical illness, where um, it's being used a lot outside of the US, but now that more studies are showing its effect on various illnesses, such as the ones that you, know, that you are primarily focused on, Ari, as well as others like traumatic brain injury and stroke and reflex sympathetic dystrophy, which is a complex regional pain syndrome. And I could stop talking now. And what are your questions? <laughs> no, that, yeah, that was beautiful. Um, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me to think about the discovery of this because it seems like there aren't many places in nature where one would be highly pressurized. Um, mm. you know, I mean, and there is obviously one, which is you going to water. water. But, but there's another. Can you think yeah, of that? So that was my question. Like yeah. with, with low pressure, we have obviously you travel up a mountain, you go to altitude, mm -hmm. you experience low atmospheric pressure. But other than diving, what what is there another? Is there another place in nature where we encounter highly pressurized environments? Oh, it's our people, Ari. It's the people, and it's the it's the homeland. Think of a place that's underneath the sea. Uh, the Dead Sea. Yeah. The so sea. below below sea level elevation. Yes. Is, so it, my guess was going to be that's not significant though but actually and that's the crazy thing is that it is and there there's actually a full study there's a full page web page dedicated to dead sea related therapeutic benefits some mm -hmm. of it's related to the mud and that mm -hmm. some and some of that might be due to, to some of the energetic qualities of the mud itself mm -hmm. but there's also a significant benefit because there is an increased atmospheric pressure there so you're a thousand meters below sea, I think, below sea level mm -hmm. equivalent, and that's going to increase the amount of oxygen in circulation. And this, this raises a good point. As soon as you pressurize air, so the air that's 21% that we're breathing now, as soon as you pressurize that, more of that oxygen is gonna go into circulation. And in fact, a lot of the studies that are negative studies that show that hyperbaric therapy doesn't work had some sort of sham or some sort of equivalent so that somebody got hyperbaric therapy and 100% oxygen and somebody else got hyperbaric therapy with just compressed air. The problem with that, that being the sham or the placebo, is that if you pressurize air to some sort of level of seawater or even air pressure like we're talking about at the Dead Sea, you instantly change physiology and you instantly change how much oxygen is getting to circulation. So for example, 1.3 atmospheres, which is about 20 feet of seawater equivalent, is going to increase the amount of oxygen in circulation by 46 or so percent. Mm. So just with pressurizing air. So that's a big deal because that let, can let, be... Let me, let me interrupt yeah. you for a sec. What, yeah. what is the difference between a true hyperbaric session versus pressurized air? So a hyperbaric session, the definition, it depends on who you ask, right? In my opinion, if you pressurize air, you are, you are basically in a hyperbaric environment. Okay. And then if you add oxygen to that, you're just increasing the amount of oxygen in that pressure. So nice. increasing the amount of oxygen that can get into circulation as a result of that. Okay. So it's, are you in a chamber with some pressurization of the environment, the air around you, or are you with that plus breathing 100% pure oxygen? It can be either. And it can okay. be, and, and it depends. So for example, you are in an open air hyperbaric chamber when you're at the Dead Sea. Okay, mm -hmm. right, but in the chambers that are available and they're different types that go to different pressures, as soon as that pressurized chamber, well, as soon as it's pressurized, you're under hyperbaric conditions. Now, if you ask the, the conventional guys, they'll say that it, hyperbaric oxygen therapy only counts after what's 1.3 atmospheres or 20 feet of seawater at 100% oxygen. But I think that's misguided. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as you pressurize a vessel, um, and you either pressurize air or you add in 100% oxygen, you are in a hyperbaric environment. Your physiology is now changed. You have the stimulus of both pressure, which is extremely important too, not only for driving oxygen into the body, but also because you're pressurizing the blood vessels and there's pressure related changes that are likely happening as a result of that, along with the, what we think is the major benefit, which is the 100% oxygen or even the oxygen pressurized in the air, whatever it is, you're getting more oxygen in circulation. And that's really where uh, you're seeing the, the effects at the, at the cellular level. Fascinating stuff. So um, a, a couple of things. One, 
it's sorry. I'm just like, there's, there's so many questions going through my head here. Um, one I of like the, questions. The, the things that, that piqued my interest was actually, um, seeing a, a documentary on strongman training with this mm. guy named Eddie Hall, who I think won the world's strongest man competition maybe mm -hmm. last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was, you know, they showed him going into a hyperbaric chamber after training. And I think Michael he Phelps, said too. something to the effect of like, he can recover from training sessions uh, using hyperbaric in, in what used to take 48 hours to recover. He can recover in like four hours. Yeah. Um, you know, that same level of recovery. And so by doing that, he can then train like twice as much as he would otherwise be able to. And so, I mean, and he just went on and on about how amazing it's been for him. So yeah. obviously that's one application is, you know, elite athletes using it to enhance recovery. Right. What other kinds of yeah. applications are, are common uses of this? Yeah. So just to follow up on that, it's, I haven't seen that documentary. I have to take a look at it. That sounds yeah. awesome. The, there is a good, I think it's a, is it a Under Armour commercial where Michael Phelps goes into a hyperbaric chamber too? Mm -hmm. so he uses it as well. And, and that's how we're using it. Well, there's a couple of different ways we're using it in athletes on the elite side, of course, but also in the weekend warrior types or the people that like to do tough mutters or, you know, the five, 10 Ks or whatever. Yeah. Um, I'm, so, I'm not competing in anything, but I, you know, yeah. I rock climb and I weight right. and I surf and I do a lot of activity. So I, I you know, I had actually looked into buying a soft chamber one for, yeah. for home. Uh, but then I heard some people talking about hard chambers being much better and those are really expensive. So anyway, mm -hmm. maybe a question for later. Sorry to interrupt. That's a, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Yeah. I'll, I definitely want to touch on that because it's yeah. an important point, especially to delineate the difference between the two types, but mm -hmm. okay. Put that aside for now. Um, on the elite athlete or the athletic side, there is the ability to increase endurance uh, because we actually can regrow blood vessels around the heart or actually grow more blood vessels. So that's going to increase your cardiac capacity. Also, regrows blood vessels in the brain, for example. And we'll get to this when we talk about, I'm getting ahead of myself as always. But um, anyway, so from the elite athlete perspective, it's improving endurance, improving recovery, injury recovery. And that extends towards what the other reasons we're using hyperbaric therapy for, which was your question. And, and so really, I think with the, the, to take a one little step back, or maybe a large step back, but important is say, you have all this oxygen in circulation, right? Now, what is that actually doing, right? And so, and then you have to think about, uh, there is the acute stimulus of hyperbaric therapy, increasing oxygen in the circulation, and there's the more long-term benefit of having a hyperbaric oxygen therapy stimulus, okay? So in the acute setting, you're re-oxygenating oxygenating the body very fast. So if you've had an injury, for example, if you've had a trauma, and you have some tissue that may be at risk of not staying alive, say it's your brain or your heart, or one of your limbs is hanging off, you can potentially re-oxygenate areas that may be at risk for dying because you've gotten more oxygen into circulation. It can diffuse further into the tissue. So it prevents some of that tissue that may be at risk for dying because it's not getting enough blood flow mm -hmm. from degenerating and, and then releasing all these bad factors that happen as a result of that. Cytokines, hormones, inflammatory mediators, all that stuff that gets released when tissue is at risk of, of dying. And so on the other end of that is something called reperfusion injury. So when you have all those bad things get released and then blood flow gets restored, then even more damage can happen. Mm -hmm. So on the front end, you're actually preventing some of that injury or maybe a, a significant amount of that. We talk about it in micron depth, but like basically four times more diffusion into tissue length. And so that's a crap load or a shit load, whatever you want to say, of tissue that you could potentially prevent from dying. So that's big. And, and so we're also talking about um, in the acute setting, we're also decreasing the size of blood vessels. And so if you've had an injury to a blood vessel that's leaking stuff, you want that blood vessel to get smaller so it's leaking less stuff. And so hyperbaric therapy immediately decreases the size of blood vessels. There might be the question, well, is that a good thing when you're trying to get more oxygen? But because you've saturated the plasma, plasma with so much oxygen, you're actually net getting a lot more oxygen to that tissue regardless. So say that again, it decreases the size of blood vessels? Yeah, it decreases the size of your blood vessel. But that's okay because if you've had a, a vessel that's been injured and leaking stuff, if you can decrease the size of the blood vessel, more, less stuff is going to leak out of that blood vessel, causing inflammatory changes in the tissue bed. And so... 
And that that's an acute change, correct? An when you're change. when you're when you're under the, the highly pressurized environment, right. or maybe this is on the right. Exactly. This is when you're in acute in acute hyperbaric environment, and this is what's happening in an acute injury, for example. Okay. There's more things that are happening. It's, it's dramatically decreasing inflammation almost immediately. It's also preventing a lot of the, the, the pathways that cause immediate apoptosis or immediate cell death in tissue that's been injured. It's actually all related to, interestingly enough, oxidative stress, which mm -hmm. is something that we throw around as a bad thing. And it is a bad thing if it's done unchecked, but in a short-term stimulus, it can actually be very beneficial to allow some of these changes to happen. And yeah, what, what you're, that actually is one of my areas of particular passion, what you're talking right. about there. And my audience is pr pretty familiar with that concept now because I've talked about, I've had a few people on to talk right. about it. I talk about it so much. The mm -hmm. concept of hormesis and this right. transient metabolic stressor, transient sort of spike of oxidative stress and, and mm -hmm. inflammation or, you know, depending on the type of hormetic stress, in this case, right. more oxidative stress. But right. you're introducing all of this oxygen into the system and, and creating the spike in reactive oxygen species. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and yet, it's because it's this transient spike, it's actually inducing a net antioxidant effect. Exactly. By stimulating the, the cell's internal antioxidant defense mechanisms. That's exactly what's happening. And so that's why I almost never recommend just one hyperbaric treatment because it takes about three treatments to see that reactive antioxidant capacity come up significantly through things like glutathione and, and NRF1 pathways. And it's, it's actually beautiful to see. And we've, we have these studies to, to show how that antioxidant, antioxidant capacity goes up. Now, of course, if you have a lot of oxidative stress prior to all of this, it's important to measure the levels if you can, or just if you don't have that ability to just understand that you likely have to increase your antioxidant capacity, probably exogenously, exogenously through oral antioxidant, for example, um, just to help out and make sure that you have enough capacity. Uh, but what hyperbaric therapy is, is it works through oxidative stress in the acute setting, like I was mentioning, but long-term it's causing epigenetic changes or changes to how DNA is actually expressing and suppressing genes. And that's how it causes new blood, new blood vessels to form. That's how it causes stem cells to be released from the bone marrow and other locations to go to areas of injury inflammation and heal them. That's how it, it creates new cartilage cells and new connective tissue cells and new bone. It, it can heal bone very fast, actually. And so this reflects not only in the elite athlete population, but people with chronic infections, with people with chronic injuries that are longstanding. It's the acute stimulus that can really help somebody, especially with an acute injury, heal much faster, hyperdrive that whole stimulus, wound healing, decreasing inflammation, reversing low oxygen. But in the long term, in patients with chronic medical illness, especially in an integrative mindset, looking at what the whole picture of the person is, that's where you can see complete rejuvenation of the body's physiology. And we're using this therapeutically for things like chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia in the integrative setting. But even in the anti-aging world, in the, the Israelis call it reverse aging, and they have a a huge program in Tel Aviv, and I think I was telling you about this already mm -hmm. when we met, these guys have like a 20,000 person waiting list simply for rejuvenative medicine in a hyperbaric chamber, regenerating blood vessels in the brain, in the heart, in the penis, um, and the, <laughs> the that's, doctor- That's mainly what the 20,000 person <laughs> waiting list is. <laughs> 19,998 of them are men with erectile uh, It's a great story. The, the doctor's name is Dr. Shai Afradi. <laughs> He showed me a picture of a penis, an MRI, a uh, blood vessel before and after, so blood vascular flow. And then he said, I give these to my patients, and they show them to their friends, and I have more patients. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Gotta love the Israelis, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, what, you know, I want to go back to something real quick that you, you, you kind of mentioned in passing, yeah. which is in some people, uh, and I think with severe chronic conditions, severe illness, um, in particular, like chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, there's a number of others, maybe chronic Lyme disease mm -hmm. or uh, maybe chronic Epstein-Barr. There, there, there are a number of conditions where um, there seems to be a dysregulation of redox status, of, mm -hmm. of the body's sort of ability to respond to oxidative stress 
And there seems to be this chronic oxidative stress that's going on at the cellular level. Mm -hmm. um, and in those people, you, you kind of alluded to this, but uh, in those people, they seem to be maybe highly sensitive to, to it and maybe get negative effects. The same way, um, you know, if you take a person with chronic fatigue syndrome and ask them to do exercise, they're extremely mm -hmm. intolerant to exercise and they yeah. have something called post-exertional malaise where they basically okay. feel wiped out for several days after this. And part of that seems to be this kind of lack of this poor redox status at the cellular level. Mm -hmm. um, on, the, on the contrary, you mentioned maybe supplementing with antioxidants, but there's also research, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there's research from uh, a German researcher named Mike, Michael Risto, who has shown that if you take antioxidants around exercise, you actually inhibit the benefits of exercise. Very true. So, yeah. so I'm wondering if maybe yeah. that's this also true, like uh, maybe on the surface, it seems like a good idea, hey, take a bunch of antioxidants prior to doing your hyperbaric sessions, but maybe that inhibits at least some of the, the benefits of the hyperbaric session? Yeah, and I think that's a, great, that's a great paper and it's a great description of what's happening under oxidative stress and especially the uh, the stress intolerance of people with a lot of chronic inflammation. And I do see that happen in the chamber. So for example, you mentioned chronic fatigue and Lyme, perfect ex examples of this. When I started, first started training in hyperbaric therapy, I saw Lyme patients go into the chamber and they couldn't walk for a week, wow. right? If we went to, if we put them in deep pressures, I saw chronic fatigue patients with the same kind of thing because of that oxidative stress dysregulation, probably genetic expression changes as a result of this chronic oxidative inflammatory you know, milieu or environment at the, uh, in the cellular level. And so um, I often, prior to understanding about the, the concept of testing, health optimization medicine, as you know, and from having Dr. Ted on, is that um, even if I gave antioxidants, it was better because at least they can tolerate treatment, you know, especially if it's being done in an integrative way. If we like, look, you know, we know that you have a lot of the oxidative stress. We know that hyperbaric therapy can help. We probably would mitigate some of the effects in a normal person, but in somebody that has a lot of ongoing stress, it may make sense. Now, yeah. optimally, you don't do that. You let the hermetic stress happen. You let that reactive antioxidant response happen. But in the real world with chronic complex medical illness, the best case scenario and something that I've implemented in my practice is the health optimization medicine framework, which is testing for antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, cofactors, gut health, food sensitivities. And then once you have all of that in place, that's when you can even start really, really optimizing, right? So health optimization medicine is a cellular optimization framework that works beautifully, beautifully for everybody. It doesn't matter if you're extremely sick or you don't have any medical problems. We all should optimize at that level. And then you should take it to the functional medicine approach. If, if you have chronic Lyme, for example, I will never put somebody in a hyperbaric chamber after my experience that doesn't also have a Lyme literate physician that's also helping them. Because if they're not looking in combination, some of the benefits from hyperbaric therapy may be transient, or they may not happen at all, or they may not be optimal. So I think the key really is to measure if you can, if that's not possible, then looking at a, an integrative strategy as much as possible. So look, especially detox, that's the biggest thing I've found in patients that have a lot of inflammatory oxidative stress. We talk about I mean, saunas and we talk about, I mean, there's some controversy on colon hydrotherapy, but I have had some patients that have had some success there from detox and, and the Hertzheimer kind of reaction that that can happen from Lyme especially. Yeah, interesting. So uh, a couple things that come to mind. Um, one, is, one is just, I'm wondering if a lot of this could be, well, actually, sorry. The, the first one is, uh, if you take antioxidants around the hyperbaric se session, it seems to me that maybe a lot of the benefits of hyperbaric specifically are not necessarily from hormesis. Maybe that's just part of the overall, mm -hmm. uh, you know, complex of different mechanisms, but it's possible that maybe you could get a lot of healing benefits just by elevating tissue oxygen levels. Um, and that's not affected by taking the antioxidants, whereas some of the oxidative, right. excess oxidative stress could be mitigated by taking antioxidants. Right with that specific kind of hormetic stress. Especially bugs that don't like oxygen. 
right? Yeah. So that's, that's, an, it's, that's a key factor. So uh, Orin bugs, they don't like a lot of oxygen. And mm -hmm. That's the other thing. So like, for example, the Borrelia, Lyme, is what's called a facultative anaerobe, basically doesn't like high oxygen, in, uh, oxygen environments. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why we think it's effective for Lyme, especially. The, the co-infections that typically come with Lyme, like Babesia, Bartonella, uh, some other ones are Lichia, uh, Chlamydia, et cetera, they are oxygen savvy. However, we do have some indications anecdotally that because if we use deeper pressures, we're okay. And we can still cause enough oxidative stress to really have some effect on those organisms themselves. But this puts up, a, I think, a really important part of understanding the difference between, and you mentioned this before, Ari, about soft chambers versus hard chambers. Mm -hmm. Soft chambers go to 1.3 atmospheres, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's 22, 24 feet of seawater equivalent. What, by the way, uh, real quick, what was the atmospheric yeah. pressure at the Dead Sea? The Dead Sea, oh, it's like 1.03 atmospheres or something like okay. that. So, so it's know, not a huge amount of- The change is enough to mm -hmm. induce an effect. And that's, and that's what's beautiful about it. So that's why I think the soft chambers can have an effect, okay? But at the same time, it's important to understand where I think they can mostly be effective. And I think that's actually mostly neurocognitively mm. plus exercise optimization. So for recovery, because you are getting a pressure wave, right? So you get that pressure when you're under pressure and that pressure is going to stimulate lymphatic flow. So it will stimulate lymphatic detox, some hermetic stress, but not a huge amount. And I think that's where you're seeing some of the improvements from exercise and I'm having patients that are using it for cognitive enhancement, cognitive optimization. But if you're using hyperbaric therapy for infection, I do not recommend the soft chambers because you really need to get to those deeper pressures to get enough oxidative stress and enough oxygen to some of these bugs that may like a little bit of oxygen, but they don't like a lot of oxygen, okay? So, and I have seen patients get worse in the soft chambers, even, and this is interesting, when they're using it for cognitive enhancement, right? So they think they're using it because they're going to get their brains better, but they feel worse. Mm. And nine times out of 10, this is because they have bugs floating around that they didn't know of. Mm. And this is something that I see a lot now in traumatic brain injury, because post-concussive syndrome or traumatic brain injury is something that's on the rise. We know more about now. And we often think of it as a hit to the head, and then these symptoms last a long time. The question is why? And there's two reasons in my, in my estimation. That's because they need health optimization medicine to balance, optimize all those pathways. But a significant proportion of these patients that I've found have infections floating around or have a dysregulation of their immune system because of an infection. And it may not be the infection itself that's causing it. So they're vastly underappreciated in the general community. So let, let me just interrupt real quick. So you're yes. saying in people who get uh, like concussion, get some kind of head injury, um, what differentiates those who experience lasting symptoms for a really long time versus those who recover? You, you think infections are a factor there? They can be. Yeah, that's definitely been my experience. It's usually some sort of, it's crazy what I see. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll see a patient come to me and they'll have a brain injury for like three months. And then I have them check their labs and they're iron deficient. I mean, that's going to do it too. Mm. But if you've done the basic stuff and all that looks okay, and then you do, hypothetically, you do health optimization medicine if you can on these patients. But a lot of times I'll just go directly to infection testing too. If there's any indication to me that they may have an infection floating around, um, if possible, at least doing some screening because you're going to optimize them if you can treat them, obviously, and then you're going to save them a bunch of money and a bunch of time in something that wasn't going to be effective for them. So that's where I was going. Very, very interesting. So uh, one question I have for you on the whole hormetic stress aspect of things. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, do you have particular times that you treat people for? And are there like specific protocols mm -hmm. where someone comes in and, you know, everybody is given a whatever, a 45 minute session, or I don't right. know how long the sessions last, but uh, however yeah. long of a session is that? The yeah. case, how it normally works. Yeah, so it's, it's an important point. So no matter what type of chamber you use, whether it's a soft or a hard chamber, you're usually doing it in successive days of treatment. So it's not just once or twice a week, unless it's for exercise recovery. Otherwise, it's being done in a cumulative way because the way we're working is epigenetically, like we discussed. So looking at how to suppress and express genetic material differently. And so that takes a, a stimulus that's done 
Usually, usually as far as the amount of time per treatment, it's about 60 to 90 minutes per treatment. Mm -hmm. That's done Monday through Friday with the weekends off for some period of time. So for example, in an acute injury, three treatments is usually the minimum, sometimes a little bit more. So I have patients that come in after ACL tears, hip fracture re repairs, Tommy John surgeries, if or NFL athletes that have tricep repairs or whatever, you know, all this stuff, these people can get a significant stimulus very quickly, like three treatments. Mm -hmm. But if it's more of a chronic issue, more of a long-term, long-standing chronic illness or a chronic condition, then we're talking 20, 40, sometimes as many as 60 or 80 treatments to really see the full benefits of, of being in the chamber. Okay. But it's a significant time investment, as you can see. And so uh, that's why I love to optimize beforehand just to maximize somebody's time in their chamber or in, in a chamber because I understand that this is an investment in time and, and money too. Yeah. So the reason that I bring that up is that uh, with regards to these people who are highly reactive to mm -hmm. these sorts of oxidative stress um, and, and really have, you know, feel wiped out for, for days afterwards, um, it leads people with a lot of these conditions, my experience is chronic fatigue syndrome, specifically in fibromyalgia, right. but it, it leads a lot of these people to conclude, hey, I'm not supposed to, to exercise because exercise wakes right. me up, makes me feel, uh, makes me feel terrible. Mm -hmm. I'm not supposed to go in the sauna because I've tried going in a sauna and I felt terrible. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's very, very counterintuitive for, for, for these people to actually start to do some of these hormetic stressors. Mm -hmm. And yet, in my experience, hormetic stress is actually one of the most powerful ways to get these people to recover. Right. Um, and there's good data to support that. Yeah. So the, the trick, though, is that these people have to start at very, very small doses, way mm -hmm. smaller than good most call. people can, can tolerate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and we do that in the chamber, too. Yes. Okay. So yeah, that's yeah. what I was getting at is like, yeah. does everybody get, you know, 60 oh, minute yeah. treatments or, or yeah. to 90, 90 minute treatments? Or do, you know, you take people with Lyme disease or chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia and say, we're going to give you a five minute treatment to start with and then a, an eight minute treatment and, and so on. Usually the way we do it is not changing the time as much as we change the pressure. The pressure. So we'll start off very lightly. Mm -hmm. And especially in patients like you're discussing, it's extremely, it's extremely important. And I, I said, one of the challenges in my field is that um, there isn't the universal understanding of this, right? So you'll have patients that'll have these terrible experiences and they'll come to me and say, you know, Dr. Scott, I went into a chamber, I couldn't move for a week. And, I'm like, okay. and most, most physicians will, will see that as placebo, as, as nocebo effects or as just hypochondria or something like that. Right. It's all in their head, like right. the usual stuff. And so in my experience, just like you said, Ari, it's really important to titrate up. I've had patients with chronic Lyme, for example. So typically the pre treatment depth for Lyme is like two or 2.4 atmospheres. So up to about 45 feet of seawater, but they start herxing at like 1.3 or 1.5. Oh, wow. And if that happens, first of all, I've already had this discussion with them. I know how sick they are. And so often, especially in Lyme disease, I don't recommend patients go into a chamber until they've actually gotten about 80% better mm. because that's when the power of that last 20% that we can really help with. Mm -hmm. So the challenge also, again, anybody that has their treatment and says, you should just go to my treatment. This is what you should do. This is what I do, right? If you're a cardiologist, you can get an echocardiogram. If you're I don't know, a pulmonologist, you get a chest X-ray and, and pulmonary function test in the conventional setting. So in, in the hyperbaric field, it's the same thing, but, and that's why my practice is an integrative one. So when somebody comes to see me or the way I practice is like, yeah, you found me because you wanted hyperbaric therapy, but now let's discuss this bigger picture of how we can help you. Like, are you seeing a Lyme literate physician? Have you considered health optimization medicine? You probably haven't heard about it. Go watch Dr. Ted's podcast with Ari or one of his others, right? To get a sense of what, what you can do. Let's talk about other practitioners. Let's talk about massage therapists, lymphatic massage specialists. Let's talk about chiropractic and neurochiropractic and osteopathic. Uh, talk about other technologies, neurofeedback, floating in a float tank, lots of other technologies that you and I both know very well. And mm -hmm. it can be a great, it can be a great, a great integrative way to, to describe the, the power of what we do, understanding that what I do in the hyperbaric field is a, I think it's a, an amazing synergizer. I think it's an amazing accelerator of healing and of optimization. 
but done in a silo on its own is just not as good as it could be. Mm -hmm. And sometimes not what you should do. And so if somebody says to me, I'm not going to see a Lyme doctor, I'm not going to go see a functional medicine doctor, I go, okay, good luck. Mm. Uh, you can maybe try the sauna, <laughs> you know, something that's going to be easy for them to do because it's, it's not something that I feel, I want, my own passion is to help people and I don't feel like that's really helping if I say, yeah, just go in the chamber and see how you do. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, so we've talked about a few different applications of this with infections, with athletes, mm -hmm. with spacing on what else you mentioned there. I mean, it was all kind of, I threw it all together. In this it's all in a big interweb, yeah. and we know with I all these other discussions. Then. We can do like a list, you know. I can. Do yeah, something. but so yeah, so let's let's condense this into a list of like yeah. maybe some of the best uh, conditions best. or uses for this technology. Okay, best of. I like it. So, and it's also important, I think, for your listeners and viewers to to know that the way I experienced hyperbaric therapy was in a trauma center, and because that was the case, hyperbaric therapy is a covered Medicare commercial insurance, covered modality, covered treatment for four conditions that hopefully none of you ever have, but if you do, it's very effective. The first, as I mentioned already, is if you have diabetes and you have an ulcer on your foot, it can prevent amputations, it can heal wounds on your feet. So that's a good thing. I've had patients that have come to see me with amputations prior, we save a toe or a leg, and they tell me, well, why didn't I, I know about this before I had my other amputations? And, and so this is a grassroots kinds of thing. Unfortunately, in the U.S., our, our predilection is for intervention. And, for, uh, and, and unfortunately, doctors also get paid for procedures. So there is some issue there. But anyway, diabetic foot ulcers is number one. Number two is radiation injury from cancer. So if you've had radiation treatment to your prostate, to your breasts, to your brain, to your head and neck, you get an injury, hyperbaric therapy is a covered indication. It will be covered by your insurance plan. It will help you. It's probably the best treatment for radiation injury, hands down. I've seen patients bleeding for years, either from the rectum or from uh, when they, when they uh, urinate, and it stops the bleeding, they stop getting pain. It's, it's, it's really quite beautiful. And obviously very uh, satisfying for all involved. Mm -hmm. And uh, the third one is chronic bone infection, so something called osteomyelitis. Another one is sudden hearing loss. So those that have had a sudden loss of hearing, this is a crazy one. It can happen to anybody any age. You wake up one morning, you lose hearing. We think this is either a viral infection or maybe autoimmune. Hyperbaric therapy can regenerate that hearing. Wow. And again, it's, this happens, it's, it's crazy. What I, I mean, you wake up one day, you, you can't hear the next day. Uh, it's, it can come back in the chamber, but unfortunately a lot of ENTs don't immediately refer. So just you know, keep that in your mind. Um, but that's, that's the covered indications. And then there's, there's this big box of, of investigational, not covered by insurance, so it's gonna be an out-of-pocket cost for the, the client. And that includes traumatic brain injury. A lot of great data coming out in traumatic brain injury. Yeah, I've seen a, patient, a number of, of great studies there. Yeah, so it's, it's amazing. I'm, I mean, I've, seen, I've had I mean, kids that are suicidal from ski accidents go back to school and get good grades. Wow. I mean, amazing what I can see. And, and, and athletes, uh, veterans as well, so patients that have been in, in, the, in the military service. And a lot of it also has an effect on the PTSD portion as well, because a lot of that is really uh, combined together. They've done some studies looking at veterans, and I think three quarters of those that have been classified as having PTSD actually have brain injuries as well. And so, and it's not surprising because the pressure blast, this is a little crazy, but the, the pressure blast from an IED actually causes air embolism in the brain. And wow. air embolism is like these small pockets of air that block blood flow for you know, microseconds. But that microsecond loss of blood flow is actually causing you know, tissue damage. Wow. It's actually quite crazy. So in any respect, traumatic brain injury, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is a match made in, in beautiful, optimistic, and optimization heaven. <laughs> so, um, and I've seen it countless times, unless they have an infection, as I said. Yeah. So, um, so traumatic brain injury, patients post-stroke, uh, patients uh, with reflex, reflex sympathetic dystrophy or complex regional pain syndrome, patients that are pre-post-surgery, they just wanna heal faster from their surgery, it's gonna heal you about 50% faster. And that could be important if you're an athlete, or if you just care about getting off your feet or on, back on your feet, or if you don't want to have 
raccoon eyes after your plastic surgery on your nose, you know, for example. And that's, that's cool too. Additional things, um, we're looking in the neurocognitive world now, like patients with mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, even multiple sclerosis. There's some relatively good data. Uh, it's coming out, but um, I can keep going. But the rejuvenative, rejuvenative medicine department, so combining hyperbaric therapy with PRP and stem cells, uh, I've had some significant success doing that, not only for athletes, but actually in some patients with traumatic brain injuries, patients with Lyme disease, interestingly enough, uh, stem cells plus HBOT plus ozone. It's kind of a crazy combination, but I've seen some really amazing results. Yeah. Uh, I could keep going, but I think that's... Yeah, no, maybe <laughs> if you want to keep going, if there's any, one, if, if any ones that come to mind that you feel like you're missing, I have a couple specific questions. Yeah, please ask. I think that, that'd be helpful. Oh, there's a cancer too. Cancer too. <laughs> no, that yeah. was one of my questions. So okay. yeah. uh, cancer, I think, you know, feels like to me kind of an interesting one because we hear sometimes kind of this talk of like cancer thrives in more of an anaerobic environment. Right. Uh, and then, you know, at the same time, there's also part of the mechanism of hyperbaric therapy is that it stimulates angiogenesis. It right. stimulates blood vessels. blood vessel formation, which is, you know, cancers are already kind of doing that excessively and we don't, we, maybe we don't want to stimulate that. So it seems like there's some yeah. mechanisms that you could potentially make the case for either wouldn't be good or, or might be good. What, what's the actual verdict as far as have studies looked at, at the effect yeah. on cancer? Yeah. So they've, they've done a number of reviews on cancer specifically in the chamber. And there's no indication at all that hyperbaric therapy has any progressive effect on cancer. Okay. And uh, they've looked at a couple specific cancers as being a mild the regressive effect, simply just being in the chamber. One of them being glioblastoma, which is not surprising given it's a very hypoxic tumor, very low oxygen environment. And also in breast cancer, actually, interestingly enough. Mm. But we often, the way I think about hyperbaric therapy in cancer is a synergistic tool. It's not a treatment for cancer directly. But to finish up, I think the reason, we don't know exactly why hyperbaric therapy doesn't make cancer grow. But we do think that it has something to do with how blood vessels form in a hypoxic environment in, around a, a cancer versus how they form naturally in a place that's had an injury, for example. They form very differently. They use different hormones, different cytokines, different inflammatory mediators. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, we think that's why. Mm -hmm. But I can say, even though those studies haven't been done exactly, there's been several reviews over time. I think the last one back in, in 2012 or 2013 that show exactly this point, that there's no indication hyperbaric therapy has a, a pro-growth effect on cancer. And may but, have a slight yeah. regressive effect. Yeah, and we're using, and we know that actually it, it helps chemotherapeutic sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, it helps with radiation sensitivity as well. Glioblastoma specifically, they're looking at the combination of hyperbaric oxygen therapy with radiation, because if you hyperoxygenate the tissue, you can get more radiation to that tissue. Radiation is oxygen sensitive, so radiation only works if there's oxygen getting to that particular tissue. Mm. So, and actually, some of the, the initial data is very good. And this is interesting because um, we're looking at a high oxygen stimulus in a chamber, <clears throat> driving more oxygen to the body that oxygen stays in circulation for a period of time once you leave the chamber. So what they're doing is they're putting somebody in a chamber and immediately rolling them over to radiation. Interestingly, this probably also has applications to endurance and, and athletes because if you have extra oxygen in circulation for an hour, hour and a half after you get out of a chamber, say it's a soft chamber next to a race, for example, you have an increased oxygen carrying capacity as a result of that extra oxygen without having to dope and give yourself more red blood cells mm -hmm. or take EPO uh, yeah. for that hour and a half once you get out of the chamber. So interestingly, it does have that application as well. But back to cancer, so chemosensitization, radiation sensitization, it's going to help you heal faster from any oncologic surgery that you might have needed. Now, I know, and I've seen some of your, your thoughts about the ketogenic diet, but the ketogenic diet with hyperbaric therapy does seem to be a little bit of a one-two punch in the sense of you know, starving cancer, at least as far as a health strategy, the ketogenic diet, you know, we can talk about a different, you know, that's a different thing, I think, but no, I mean, there, there's definitely some positive research in right. certain cancers for sure. And certain, yeah, not all cancers, yeah. not yet. And that's also important. It's not all cancers. And I think that's another issue that we're looking at. Some prostate cancers are actually fat savvy, right? And some uh, melanomas are fat savvy as well. So you, so you have to be careful here, right? 
However, in, in actually metastatic prostate cancer, for whatever reason, it's not fat savvy and it responds to the ketogenic diet, but localized prostate cancer. Anyway, I have other people that are smarter than me that, that, I, that I refer patients to um, if, if they're interested in this. Yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to have a, a, a guy named Chad Macias, who's a, a cancer researcher, um, and he talks a lot about where ketogenic diets are useful and, and where they're not in different kinds of cancers. It's a fascinating have, subject, and yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to dig into all that with him yeah. very soon. And I have uh, the clinical applications. I have a great lady you need to talk to. She's in Oregon. Her name is Dr. Dawn Lamont, and she's an integrative oncologist. Uh-huh. And so she's, she's actually doing chemo, but she's also doing keto. She's doing mathematical modeling of prostate cancer. Very interesting stuff. Oh, so, cool. Yes, yeah, so I'll put you guys in contact. But anyway. That'd be great. So um, I think also when we were in person, you mentioned to me a little about um, multiple sclerosis and autoimmune diseases, if mm-hmm. I'm remembering correctly. So can you talk a bit about those or maybe some cases where hyperbaric uh, therapy is, is not a good idea? Yeah, that's also a great question. Um, I think when it comes to autoimmune disease and multiple sclerosis, it depends on number one, what do you believe about multiple sclerosis, right? Do you believe it's an autoimmune phys- physiology or a path- pathophysiology? Do you think it's a viral? Do you think it's bugs? I mean, I have seen patients that have been diagnosed with MS that also have Lyme. I'm sure you know those patients too. Mm-hmm. So I think I'm not quick to put these patients in chambers. However, unless they're having an acute flare. Now, what I have seen it be able to do in acute flare is mitigate inflammation, mitigate tissue loss, in this case, neural tissue loss in patients with multiple sclerosis. So that's an exception. For the most part, if you have autoimmune disease, if you have an autoimmune condition, it's really important <clears throat> that I am just a single part of a team that's helping this patient, okay? Um, in my experience, functional medicine is extremely helpful here. And also now, of course, the non-illness medicine side, the health optimization medicine side, that I think is so extremely important with these patients. I will, if you don't do that work first, these patients are not gonna get better in a hyperbaric chamber. Mm-hmm. If they do, it's going to be fleeting. And in some cases, that could be a good thing. So for example, I've had a couple of lupus patients with, you know, with kidney problems, with looking at the point of dialysis because they have so much inflammatory cascades going on. You can mitigate some of that inflammation in the chamber because we know hyperbaric therapy is as effective as at steroids acutely and actually has the effect on TNF alpha, which is one of the major drug targets for a lot of these disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, other autoimmune conditions. So we know it's going to work acutely to help patients. But again, knowing that it's not going to be the answer in the long term, for sure. Awesome. So I guess on a final note, um, where, where do you practice if somebody wants to come see you? Um, how do they work with you? So I live in the Bay Area, as you know, Ari, and uh, I work virtually as well as in a couple hyperbaric clinics in my area. I also work virtually at a couple hyperbaric clinics across the U.S. I am involved with a company in New York called Hyperbaric Medical Solutions. Is this and like they, virtual hyperbaric therapy where somebody just puts on some goggles and then they... they oh, just, man. <laughs> I wish. Like a VR experience with pressure. No, like, but, <laughs> but seriously, explain, explain what that means that you work. Yeah, virtual. yeah. Yeah, so I, I, what I've done is that I realized that I think where I'm best, I think where I can best facilitate is in an online presence so that people from around the world can contact me, talk to me about hyperbaric oxygen therapy in my context, which is an integrative context. And then what I can do is is help them understand how it can best be utilized within their own particular framework, depending on what's going on. So I I coordinate with facilities all over the world, the Israelis, England, Scotland, Ireland, new facilities are popping up all around, United Arab Emirates. But then I also work more closely with a couple places in the U.S., um, but I'm, I'm, I know a lot of the facilities around here. So if I'm not directly affiliated, I can help coordinate with local facilities and help with protocol recommendations, help with local docs, local functional docs, local health optimization medicine docs as well um, as they get trained. And so what I do is I'm like a conductor of hyperbaric therapy, but like really I'm just a conductor in the sense of an integrative medicine doctor, health optimization medicine doctor, helping patients you know, virtually. So my website is integrativehbot.com. 
So you go there, you can contact me there. We can set up an online consultation. And, on, and on, just, just spell that for people. Um, yeah. So it's I integrative and then H-B-O-T, correct? Yes, so integrative, H-B-O-T. Dot com the word integrative and the letters hbot dot com just and in so case just I heard B as, as P or something like that I would yeah you know Google Scott Sher MD and yeah. either you'll get some guy at Sony that's not me or or me <laughs> <laughs> and, and so the other places you can find me as you like me know Ari um, is healthoptimizationmedicine.org, which is I am part of that organization as you know and then also at Dr. Schur, D-R-S-H-E-R-R, -R, uh, on Twitter, and as well as on Facebook, Integrative HBOT is my, is my page there. So, so, so I have to say, you're way more important than I realized. I thought you here, I thought you were just like running a clinic over in the Bay Area, and people would have to travel across the country to work with you or something like that, but you're, you're a consultant to, to clinics all over the world. Yeah, that's the fun part. I love seeing patients you're, in person too. Oh, no. I, I, have clinic, I have a clinic in San Francisco called Hyperbaric Medical Services, and I see patients there. And I have some clinics in San Jose, the, 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 the peninsula that I also go see. So I love seeing patients in person, too. Um, but I have uh, three more kids than you, Ari. So I try to spend as much time with my children as I can. So Yeah. Awesome, Scott. Well, this has been such a pleasure to do this with you. And uh, you're, you're very articulate and, and a great speaker. So makes it extra fun. And you're also knowledgeable about a lot of uh, tangential areas, which makes it super fun for me. The to tangents get. are fun. I love yes, the tangents. Totally. <laughs> this has been an absolute pleasure. And I, I hope to have you on again. And uh, for every, everyone listening, you can reach Scott at integrativehbot.com. So Scott, thank you again, and look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you, Ari. It's been a pleasure.